Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys, let's learn. Queen Victoria, the misunderstood monarch, preemptive like. I have a very, uh, I don't know what it is, uh, Disney movies or something? I don't know. I have a very romantic view of the 1800s British Empire, early 1900s, 1800s, Victorian era, really. Um, I don't know what it is, just the British Empire at its peak and how influential they were and powerful and and um exploring and 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 scientific advancements and everything it just i love thinking about the time period and let's learn about the namesake shall we queen victoria this video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Make sure to Head use to that if you're interested. For a free trial. Use their uh, promo code, guys. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash biographics to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Queen Victoria ruled over Great Britain for 63 years, and she is still remembered as being one of the most influential monarchs in history. When it comes to the life of Queen Victoria, biographers are actually very lucky because she wrote journals and letters documenting her daily life from the time she was a teenage girl all the way through to her death. Therefore, we know exactly what she was experiencing in her own words. However, when she was close to death, she asked her daughter Beatrice to edit and rewrite many of her journals and destroy much of the original text that might offend members of her family. After her death, her children took it upon themselves to burn certain chunks of her life that they were embarrassed of. Because of that, we have the image of her that her children wanted us to see. A woman who was known as the Widow of Windsor and spent her entire life mourning the death of her husband. But her I would hate that, okay? If any anyone was given like that, uh, you know, you have that title, you're a queen or a king or whatever, and you have you're going to have this long legacy after your death and people are going to learn about you. I would not want the bad stuff to be left out. I'm dead. I want people to just learn about me if, if, if I was a king or a queen or, you know, people don't really get that, uh, that honor anymore. It's a good reason. But it's like having a statue or a painting in your honor before, uh, you know, photography. Do you want people to view what you looked like or some embellished uh grand image of you more like what you wish you looked like with these giant burly arms and uh more chiseled jaw and i i would just want as accurate as possible just so that because after i'm dead i'm not gonna have an ego and i just want people to learn about me so i i, I don't understand the burning things that they wouldn't want to see that that just kind of makes me angry i just you know they're people they're okay life known as the widow of windsor and spent her entire life mourning the death of her husband but her life it was far more interesting than she's often given credit for Victoria's grandfather was George III, who was the reigning king of England ah. during her youth. Her father was Prince Edward, the Duke of Kent, and her mother, Victoria of saxe coburg salfield was born in Germany before Sorry, she... guys, I don't know what it is. There's just this built-in, involuntary feeling when I look at this guy that's just like, no. No, 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 no. Victoria of saxe coburg during her youth. Her father was Prince Edward, the Duke of Kent, and her mother, Victoria of saxe coburg salfield was born in Germany before she became the Duchess of Kent. Prince Edward would have become the next king, but he died when Victoria was very young, leaving her to be the only legitimate heir to the throne. Victoria grew up knowing that one day she would become the next Queen of England. At the time, women were never trusted with their own finances. To make matters worse, the Duchess of Kent only spoke German, but she was expected to raise an English queen. So a man named John 
Conroy was appointed as the comptroller over the lives of Victoria and her mother. Conroy took his duty much further than just being an accountant. He was an opportunist who saw this as a chance to have a powerful position in the government and pushed for control over the way Victoria was raised. In a lot of ways, he became almost like a talent agent for a child star. From an outsider's perspective, it would seem that young Victoria, she had the perfect life. She was raised in the beautiful home of Kensington Palace with toys, clothes, servants, and vacations abroad. But in her journals, Victoria often wrote that she had a very unhappy childhood. Together with her mother, Conroy created strict rules known as the Kensington System. The main goal of its design was to make Victoria weak and completely incapable of doing anything on her own. She was always in the company of a chaperone wherever she went. Instead of going to school, she had a governess to tutor her, and she was never allowed to play with other children. This was an extremely lonely life, and she desperately wanted to make friends. Conroy and Victoria's mother, they hoped that if they broke the princess down enough, they could turn her into a puppet that was easy to control. As a teenager, Conroy arranged for a tour on a train so that Victoria could see every major city in the UK. She was forced to try and memorize every single person's name and title at every dinner party. Considering these dinner parties were massive, her task it was always going to be a failure. Conroy would reprimand her, saying that she was too stupid to be queen. Needless to say, the demands and Easy, the man. constant onslaught of insults made her completely miserable. In 1835, she was visiting the town of Ramsgate, and she became very ill with typhoid fever. Conroy accused her of being lazy and being a liar. He said that she was faking her illness in order to get out of the tour. But she truly was sick, and she was lying in bed in a hotel. John Conroy burst into that hotel room with a piece of paper in hand. He said that she would be a horrible queen and demanded that she sign away her power to him so that he could be her personal secretary. This would here. have made him king by proxy because he would have had absolute power over all of her affairs. She was just 16 years old at the time and she had spent her entire life being broken down to feel completely worthless. But she still had the strength to say no to this. When she was 18, Victoria was awoken in the middle of the night by her mother, and she learns that her grandfather, he was dead. She came downstairs to find the Archbishop of Canterbury kneeling in front of her, and just like that, she was the Queen of Great Britain. Wait, did I miss something? What about uh, her dad? On the day of Queen Victoria's coronation, the Prime Minister, Lord Melbourne, was so moved by the beauty of the ceremony that he had tears in his eyes. He congratulated her and told her that she was going to do a wonderful job. He looked at her hey, with fatherly positive. pride, which was something that she had never experienced in her life. Victoria knew that she could trust him. The Prime Minister became her new father figure and her very first friend. They would spend a lot of time together doing jigsaw puzzles and taking long walks. She often wrote that his sense of humor was her favorite thing about him and that it often made her laugh. However, in public, she was forced to put on a serious face. After becoming queen, Victoria moved into Buckingham Palace and she decided to never speak to her mother or Lord Conroy again. Their plan to control her it had completely backfired. She hated both of them and was glad to finally have her independence. However, that did not stop Lord Conroy from continuing to try and slither his way back into power. He approached Lord Melbourne, claiming that the queen promised him a pension of £3,000 a year as well as a title, some land, and a seat in court. Melbourne gave in this to Conroy's guy. demands. After hearing about his lies, Victoria dismissed Jesus Christ. Seat in court. Melbourne gave in to Conroy's demands. After hearing about his lies, Victoria dismissed Lord Conroy, but he continued to work for the Duchess of Kent while they plotted their next move. When Lord Melbourne's time as Prime Minister was over and he was voted out of office, Victoria, she was devastated. She wrote about it in her journals with so much drama, it was almost as if he had died. Robert Peel became the next Prime Minister and he treated her. <laughs> They plotted their next move. When Lord Melbourne's time as Prime Minister was over and he was voted out of office, Victoria, she was devastated. She wrote about it in her journals with so much drama, it was almost as if he had died. Robert Peel became the next Prime Minister and he treated her like a stupid girl, just like John Conroy had. He was part of the Tory political party, so he demanded that Victoria dismiss her ladies-in-waiting because they were members of the Whig party. Victoria's bedchamber maids, they were her dearest friends, so she was outraged at the didn't we have a wig party too? The suggestion that she 
Victoria's bedchamber maids, they were her dearest friends, so she was outraged at the suggestion that she should fire them over politics. She flat out refused to continue to obey Peel's orders. After all, she was the queen, so he didn't really yeah, have any the rights thing to me. Yeah, this kind of frustrates me. I, well, when you're younger, you don't know. But I'm like, what are you going to do? I'm the queen. No, 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 no. I don't know. Demands of her. Robert Peel was so frustrated that he could not control her that he actually resigned from being prime minister. This incident became known as the bedchamber crisis. That <laughs> sounds like like ED or something. <laughs> the bedchamber crisis. As the bedchamber crisis. Sorry. I'm a child. Even though Victoria's mother and John Conroy were no longer on speaking terms with her, they were still trying to give more power to the German part of the family. They instructed Prince Albert, her first cousin, to court her with the plot to get their family more control over the throne. Victoria had only met Albert once before, and by the time they were both 20 years old, didn't, she would- like, Didn't they notice the birth defects? It's not like it's something that's going to be very difficult to point out. It's like, you know, we want to keep it in the family, all the power, but... You notice the kids turn out a bit, uh, but they still went with it. I, I mean, it's not the brother, at least. I was shocked at how <laughs> that is my standards are. Handsome had only met Albert once before, and by the time they were both 20 years old, she was shocked at how handsome had grown up to be. She ran home to write in her journal about how attractive he was and how her heart was pounding. Victoria had no idea that her mother had planned this clandestine meeting with Albert, but they truly did fall in love with one another. She was head over heels in love, and as the queen, she was the one to ask Albert to marry her. In her diary, there are so many intimate details about their honeymoon and it might as well be a romance novel. Victoria became pregnant just a month after her wedding. She was in constant pain and very hormonal. She struggled a lot with pregnancy, and she was extremely critical of herself. Falling into a serious depression, Victoria would write in her diary about how guilty she felt every time she lost her temper. She would often write that her husband was perfect, and she hated herself for being anything but sweet and loving towards him at all times. Little did the Queen know that this was all part of an extension Question of guys, Conroy... Uh I don't know why this came to mind, but it did. And there are women watching, maybe? That if you're smaller, do you have a, like, it wasn't she pretty short? Do you have a greater chance of dying in childbirth? Just because, like, never mind, okay. Sorry. I and the Duchess of Kent's Kensington plan. Did the Queen know that this was all part of an extension of Conroy and the Duchess of Kent's Kensington plan? Albert's German family instructed him to keep getting her pregnant so that she would remain weak and never have time to truly learn how to rule on her own. Jesus. She wrote that pregnancy made her miserable, but they had a total of nine children together. Unfortunately, Victoria did not like her kids very much. Motherhood, it was simply something she was not ready for, and she suffered from a lot of postpartum depression. For all of those years, she stated she had had a lowness and a tendency to cry. It is what every lady suffers with, more or less, and what I, during my first confinements, suffered dreadfully with. All right, so Victoria's life is about to get a whole lot more tragic, and I mean, what would a biographics video be without plenty of tragedy? But True. before we get into that, let me take a moment to tell you about Squarespace, who make these long videos possible. Squarespace, it empowers dreamers, makers, doers. I really like that ad copy. It gives them the tools to bring their creative ideas to life. Squarespace, they make it easy too. They have an all-in-one platform so you can claim a domain, build a website, and even sell online. There's no fussing around Thank getting that guys. domain from one website, bringing it to another, working out how to sell something or whatever. It's all neat and tidy on Squarespace. In fact, I've got a personal anecdote here. I'm working on a website with them right now. I had a domain, bought it somewhere else, had to transfer it over. It was relatively easy with Squarespace, but just buy your own domain on Squarespace. Squarespace, and trust me, that would be easier. <laughs> Plus, that website you make, not going to look too shabby either, and by that, I mean it's going to look amazing. They've got award-winning templates, which is a perfect starting point, and then customize it to your heart's content. Plus, 24-7 customer support, chat, and email. And they've also got loads of accessible and not confusing documentation on how to make your website great. Yeah, Plus, email marketing, email so like you month. can keep in touch with your fans or your customers. Look, Squarespace, they make it easy. Get that domain. 
get that site built get a shop up and running if you want to and do it all with squarespace head to squarespace.com for a free trial and when you're ready to launch go to squarespace.com forward slash biographics and save 10 percent off your first purchase of a website or a domain let's get to that tragedy shall we just for anyone who is fast forwarding ahead through the ad we're, we're done In the year 1861, Queen Victoria's mother died of cancer. Despite all the drama that had gone on between the two of them, she regretted not spending more time with her mother. She realized that John Conroy was the true villain here, and she regretted not taking action to repair their relationship sooner. That same year, though, her husband Albert, he also died. She was 42 years old, and suddenly the closest people in her life, they were gone. After his death, she continued to sleep next to a picture of him and had the servants lay out his clothes on the bed every morning, even though he wouldn't be there to get dressed. Whenever someone That's asked sad. her to make a decision, she would accidentally say, I'll have to ask Albert, as if she had forgotten or was in denial about his death. Victoria, she already struggled with mental illness, but these deaths, they made it far worse. People whispered that she may have inherited the Hanoverian madness. After all, there was so much inbreeding going on in that part of her family that it shouldn't be surprising that all of them were known for being a bit nuts. She dressed in black at all times and acted completely melodramatic. She wrote letters on paper with a black border to signify that she was in mourning. Instead of staying in Buckingham Palace, she went on long So people were that power crazy or afraid of, of power falling into like not their hands that they would turn a blind eye to any sort of defects or bad stuff that happens when you reproduce with someone too genetically close to you that like they were that afraid of it that, that they were like yeah well that's just part of the price holidays in germany in her diary she wrote that she wished she could have a normal life and she could live in germany with albert without having to be queen at this point everyone began to call her the widow of windsor for the rest of her life, Victoria wore black every single day. She went on one of the longest periods of mourning in history. People thought that this was tragically romantic, so they became fascinated with death. Suddenly it was fashionable to enjoy spooky and creepy things, and this inspired a great deal of amazing culture during the Victorian era. Now, most people think that this is where her story ends, and that she remained a very sad and serious woman for the rest of her days. But the reality is, is that she was able to heal, and she learned to love her life once again. After returning to the United Kingdom, Victoria met a Scottish man named John Brown when she was 45 years old. Brown had been Prince Albert's assistant whenever he visited Scotland, so he was there to pay his respects. Instead of seeing her just as the Queen, he could see that Victoria was an incredibly lonely woman and all she really needed in her life was a friend. The two of them would get into long conversations where she poured out all of the feelings that she had kept secret or just only written in her diaries for a very long time. Brown had a lot of sympathy for her and became devoted to serving her. He swore that he would never leave her side and he'd take care of her every need. The greatest gift John Brown gave her was his personality. He was loud, he was rude, and he was almost always drunk. He would drink whiskey, slipping some into Victoria's drink, saying, don't stay thirsty. No one had made Victoria laugh so much in years, and she absolutely loved it. The two became best friends and even possibly lovers. If Brown disagreed with something he did, he would yell, Woman, what are you doing? Onlookers were shocked at his level of disrespect, but she actually enjoyed it very much. No one had ever dared to talk to her like that or treat her like a normal person. Her entire life, everyone had treated her like she was weak and stupid. But John Brown, he knew how smart and strong she truly was, so he held her to a higher standard. Their friendship had lifted her spirit out of her depression, and she was the happiest she'd been in a very long time. All her life, Victoria was writing in her journals every single day, and she was an avid reader. She made a decision to do something that no other monarch had ever done before, become an author. Queen Victoria published a book called Leaves from the Journal of Our Lives in the Highlands, which was full of excerpts from her own personal journal about her friendship with John Brown and how he changed her life. It became a bestseller and sold over 100,000 copies. She even gave a dedication to John Brown's muscular legs, which peeked out of his kilt. Her kids, they were embarrassed, but then again, any kid would feel embarrassed if their mother wrote about those things and then published them. After her death, Victoria's daughter Beatrice deleted all mention of John Brown when she was rewriting Victoria's journals because their relationship it was considered to be a truly humiliating stain on the royal family.
but of course she could not erase him from history. Queen Victoria had commissioned statues to be made in John Brown's honor, and plenty of people had witnessed them together when he was alive. Victoria and John held hands together and hugged one another in public, and of course there was also the book she published about their friendship. There is also a rumor that they were secretly lovers. Victoria made sure they slept in conjoining bedrooms, and her children called him Mama's lover. On his deathbed, the Queen's personal chaplain, Reverend Norman MacLeod, confessed that he married Queen Victoria and John Brown in a secret ceremony. Years later, we would learn that he gave her his mother's engagement ring. Tragically, though, she outlived Brown too, even though he was several years younger than her. He died at age 56, so she lost yet another man in her life that she truly loved. In 1997, a movie called Mrs. Brown was made to dramatize their love story. Despite the evidence, there are still historians who refuse to believe that Queen Victoria would marry a commoner like John Brown. And if she had, they think she would have been brave enough to let the world know instead of keeping it a secret. Unfortunately, we never know all the details because... They're what? In all this time of, of uh, even her children being ashamed of any little imperfection, I I'm, 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 I'm shocked. She wanted to keep it a secret. It, oh, my God, the contradictions are so annoying. Oh, you're the queen. You're worthless. You're the queen, though. You're worthless. Ugh. Why didn't you, you tell us about it? Ah. No, instead of keeping it a secret. Unfortunately, we'll never know all the details because they've been lost forever. Thanks, kids. As we mentioned before, Queen Victoria was incapable of running a government on her own, and she was known for being a bit off her rocker. The decisions she made were usually based on her personal preferences rather than politics. Prime Minister Gladstone, he was very serious, and he didn't have any sense of humor at all. So, of course, Victoria hated him. They would write nasty letters back and forth to one another, even though they both lived in Buckingham Palace and could have easily spoken to one another face to face. The next Prime Minister, Disraeli, had a much better sense of humor and treated her with respect. He would compliment her and treat her like the role she was. Disraeli lovingly called her the Fairy Queen and gave her the title Empress of India. Queen Victoria had never been to India in her entire life, but after being given the title, she set out to learn as much about the country as she possibly could. She hired a tutor. Wasn't she given the title because there were a lot of other emperors in Europe at the time, and she wasn't, didn't have the title, but the society of, of Britain at the time would really not like to be thought of as subjects of an emperor and so hey why don't we just call you emperor but of india and so you have the empress title but you're not emperor of these people here empress and so like that's how it happened i think after being empress of india queen victoria had never been to india in her entire life but after being given the title she set out to learn as much about the country as she possibly could she hired a tutor well why don't we call you the empress of india sure I got the title. I should probably visit there. <laughs> Named Abdul. <laughs> There's something like, like hilariously depressing about that. Honestly, like I just noticed that while laughing. It's like, <laughs> oh, what? Like you're you just got like if you're an Indian person living in India at the time, and it's like, oh, now you have an empress. Just just so that like she could, just so that she could feel better in her European rulers club. Oh, you're, you're, you have an empress now. Oh, good. Why? You know, gossip and, you know, uh, ah. Karim so that she could learn to speak the Indian language, Hindustani. In her notebooks, she took notes every time she asked him how to say flirtatious or dirty things. Karim became her new favorite servant, and he was given the title of the Munshi, or the teacher. Victoria allowed him- I have to shut my mouth. She took to Karim so that she could learn to speak the Indian language as she possibly could. She hired a tutor named Abdul Karim so that she could learn to speak the Indian language, Hindustani. In her notebooks, she took notes every time she asked him how to say flirtatious or dirty things. Karim became her new favorite servant, and he was given the title of the Munshi, or the teacher. Victoria allowed him to go with her everywhere, even when she was on holiday. Compared to the loud John Brown, the people in Queen Victoria's court were actually relieved that her new favorite servant was at least soft-spoken and a real gentleman. They saw this as a huge improvement. However, Karim soon began to get showered with gifts and gained a lot more privileges. Plenty of people were concerned that Victoria was going to be taken advantage of and that she was making poor decisions. After all, being a good tutor didn't exactly qualify Karim to become someone who held a position of power. But the moment anyone questioned anything to do with Karim, she would accuse them of being racist. Abdul Karim was always getting sick, and it turns out that 
I thought that would have been something that people back then would be like, yeah. So racist was used as a term even in the 1800s. That kind of gives me a little bit of happiness that I just imagine that the term racist was just meaningless in the 1800s. I'm, I thought it was just like a, yeah, probably. That he had got gonorrhea, but of being racist. Abdul Karim was always getting sick, and it turns out that he had got gonorrhea. But of course, if the royal physician got frustrated, Victoria would pull the race card once again. He came with her on vacation to the Riviera, and the newspapers described him as a servant. She wrote a letter to the newspaper and demanded that they retract their last story and submit a correction. Abdul Karim was an educated gentleman and her Indian secretary. While she was incredibly eccentric, there is no doubt that once anyone became Queen Victoria's friend, she was fiercely loyal and made sure they lived their best life. They always died first. At 81 years old, Queen Victoria planned for her death, and when she had a hemorrhagic stroke, they knew how to prepare for her funeral. Throughout her life, Queen Victoria had been given precious jewels, but they meant nothing to her in those final days. She told her doctors that what she wanted was a number of sentimental items with her in her coffin. First was Albert's dressing gown, which she had in their bedroom all of those years. Next were the photos of the children, as well as the locks of their hair that she had collected from their first haircuts. She requested to have a framed photograph of John Brown in her hand hands laying over her heart. On her finger, she wore an engagement ring that belonged to John Brown's mother. Queen Victoria's funeral took place on February 2, 1901. Despite it being in the middle of winter, thousands of people showed up to mourn, and it became one of the largest funerals in history. She never led the country through war or ever made any substantial improvements in politics, but people, they loved her all the same. So oh, Crimean War. Many prime ministers came and sort went of. during Victoria's reign, but they have been all but forgotten. You could say that they were some of the first true influences. Guys, I know. Ex Stop it. You know, I know exactly if I could have one way to be buried or like to do with my body after I die, it would be to like research an area of like sediment or something that is likely to like not like corrode into the sea or something and that isn't that but like it's like a likely area that could be found by archaeologists in the future and just like put me in like a hilarious position just so like i can give a laugh to an archaeologist like when they find my skeleton if if they did i think that'd be such a great way Ugh. Everything they did caused a ripple effect for the rest of society, and Queen Victoria was no exception. In fact, I like put my, or just I don't know. life was so colorful that when we think of the Victorian era, we truly do get a very vivid image of that time period in our minds. The clothes, the style, the attitude of the people. They were just like the Queen, serious on the outside and wild on the inside. It's deliciously romantic and yet very dark at the same time. That time period is still popular to this day, and Queen Victoria is going to be remembered as one of the most impactful figures in history. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do give us a thumbs up below and do not forget to subscribe. We've got brand new videos just like this several times a week. Also, fantastic sponsor Squarespace. Check them out below. And as always, thank you for watching. Thank you for making. All right, guys, really cool. Can't wait to see all your comments. I got to pee really bad. Love y'all. See you guys next time. Bye.